Hi, welcome to Mom's Writers Club. I'm Sarah. I'm Jessica. And today we are going to talk about why and how to aim for 100 rejections a year. So you can be forgiven <laughs> for going, oh my God, rejection, no. Right? But we're going to talk about why this is a good thing. Okay, so Sarah, yeah. in your words, why should someone aim for 100 rejections a year? Because it keeps you productive because it makes you put yourself out there and create opportunities for your writing. And yeah. by doing that, you can make connections with other people. One opportunity can lead to another. You don't win if you don't play, basically. Totally. I feel like I know so many writers who spend so much time kind of focused on all the inner, uh, like lonely writer stuff, I like to call it, <laughs> because we spend so much time by ourselves. Yeah. And it's hard to put yourself out into the world and to put your writing out there. And and for some people, it might not make sense to, like if your goal is not to get published, it's just a hobby. Like, okay, that's different. But so many people do want to get published, but they just kind of like sit on their work and don't actually do anything with it. So by striving for 100 rejections a year, you are taking steps towards whatever that goal is, whether it's publishing a book or uh, getting more attention to your blog or publishing magazine articles. And it's also just the way the business works. Um, if you are not a celebrity or not some person with a big platform of some kind or another, you will need to seek out opportunities to publish your work. They are not generally going to come seeking you. So if you're only submitting 10 or 12 things per year, um, that's only 10 or 12 opportunities you're giving yourself. If you're submitting 100, that's 100. And a lot of it's a numbers game. So, and we'll talk about that. So, yeah, definitely. I was introduced to this idea by a blog post by a woman named April Davila. And um, Jess came across it through a prior blog post on LitHub. And they probably... <laughs> go back, as Jess was saying to Socrates. Um, so whosoever's idea this was, if you're out there, please let us know who you are, because this is really brilliant. Yeah, we like it. So what counts towards those 100? Well, I think it can be anything. For me, a lot of it was sending out queries, and I counted every single query I sent. But it can be applying for something like Pitch Wars, it can be trying to get into a different type of mentorship or um, like a, yeah, like a residency. Or a fellowship or It something. can be sending out, yeah, and I know a lot of Moms Writers Club do, uh, Moms Writers Club members do like flash fiction competitions or anthologies, so like all of that stuff counts. Mm -hmm. What else can you think of? It's basically anything that you have to submit work for to be considered, right? So we're not talking about like, a class where as long as you pay the fee, you get in the class and you take a class. That's great, right? But that isn't um, something where your work has to represent you. So I think of it as anything where you have to submit work and it needs to be considered um, in order to possibly give you this opportunity. Talking about where we got the idea from, and I read this article on LitHub, which I will post below, and it's called Why You Should Aim for 100 Rejections a Year. And it basically changed my perspective on querying because every time I sent a query out and got a rejection back, it was so depressing, right? Like it's one more time someone is saying no to you, but by aiming for 100 rejections, you're putting yourself out there. You're giving yourself opportunity because, you know, you're, you are going to get rejected. That's a lot of what the publishing industry is, but you will never get a yes if you don't risk a no. And if you get a no, you're nowhere different than you already were, right? Like you, do, for example, I didn't have a literary agent. I wasn't going to get one if I didn't send queries out. So for me, like my goal is to send a hundred queries out a year. And I think the same year I made that goal, I signed with my agent. Yeah. And it takes the sting out of rejection to me. I mean, it'll always sting. I'm not yeah. saying like you're ever going to be happy about it, but it puts a little bit more back in your control. I mean, I'm all about like, what part of this process can I control? You know, and if I actually have a goal that I want to get 100 rejections in a year and I'm doing this for a reason, then when I get a rejection back, as much as it may totally suck, I at least get to like check off another little box on my on my list. Right. And feel like I've accomplished something. 
let's break down the categories of what counts on your list of 100, yeah. right? It's actually harder to get to 100 than, than you might think, right? You think, oh, I'll just send out a million of whatever. But um, I actually tried very hard for about four years and I only ever got to, I think I got to about 75 one year. And that was submitting a lot of different things. So that's pretty good. I know, just hit 100. She's an achiever. <laughs> so maybe let's start with queries. Yeah. So how many queries did you send out um, last year? So I have no idea how many I sent out last year, but I know how many I sent out per book. Okay. All right. So I don't remember exactly when I started querying my third book, which is which did not give me an agent, but I sent out 54 queries for that one. And I think I started querying that one in early 2020, like in March or April. And I sent out 54 queries on that one. Mm -hmm. And then for the next book, book four, which is the one that got me my agent, I sent out a total of 80 queries. So in 2020, I'm trying to do math in my head, <laughs> I think that's 134 queries that I sent out. And with that, I got a total of 35 requests and three offers. You sent out 134 if, queries in 2020? Yeah, over two books. Yay! Yeah, it looks like it. And I also applied, I think I applied for Pitch Wars mm -hmm. that year. I might have, I think with my third book, I applied, or I, um, Submitted it to two publishers that accepted uh -huh. manuscripts from unagented authors at the time. Cool. So, yeah, you know, and if I hadn't sent all of those out, I wouldn't have gotten that many requests, yeah. which wouldn't have been as many opportunities for people to say yes. Right. So when an author starts querying, how do you recommend they um, think about the numbers? Like how many agents to query? How often? Yeah, I think that this is kind of a complex topic and probably could even be its own episode. Oh, I think it will be. But I'm a big fan. Our chance to yeah do a. Overview. I'm a big fan of sending out at least 50 queries per book, but not all at once. I like to look at Query Tracker and see how fast of responders agents are. And for my first batch of queries, I go with faster responders, mm -hmm. like less than 10 days, so far as whether mm -hmm. they request a book or not. And I send out. I start with five, and then. I get like excited and usually send out five more. So in that first couple of weeks, I send out a total of 10 and I kind of wait and see what happens. And I hope to get at least one request from that. I do think that's a pretty small sample size to gauge whether or not your query is successful, mm -hmm. but it, it, it was effective for me in book three and book four, both of which I got a lot of requests for. Um, once I kind of get going with querying, I like to have 25 queries actively out at any given time. Oh, that's and that's probably a higher number than like the average person. So after a couple of weeks, I would send five more. Or sometimes for every rejection I got, I would send out one or two more queries to maintain like having so many people potentially looking at my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so far as like a hundred rejections and being able to control how many queries you send, I truly believe that um, that it that getting an agent is a combination of many things. And we've kind of talked about this before. And some of it is timing and I swear some of it is luck like getting the right manuscript in front of the right person at the right time when the market is doing whatever it's doing. And you increase your chances of hitting that like right combination if you send more queries out than less. And it also forces you to do more agent research in the process of which you may find more really awesome agents that you hadn't even known were out there, right? Because if you're saying to yourself, okay, I'm going for 50 queries on this book or whatever, um, that means you got to research and you got to find 50 people and you got to figure out their names and what they represent and what they sold and what they're after and all that. So, so that, and you learn a lot in the process. You yeah. learn kind of what people are looking for right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moving on from queries. So what else you wanna... besides queries? <laughs> so if all you want to do is write novels and all you want to do is find a literary agent, then you're just going to send queries, right? No, not necessarily. Well, <laughs> of course not. I definitely did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, the thing is, if you do that, that's fine. It's totally fine. But there are other things you could do with novel length work. Um, Tell us about them. There are mentorship programs, right? Everybody's heard of Pitch Wars, probably, yeah. where you send your work for a mentorship and an agent showcase and everything like that, right? That would count. Yeah, and author author mentor match is very similar to Pitch Wars. I think without the agent showcase, but the same idea. Yeah. You're applying for a mentor. Right, 
like a really serious, cool mentorship program. And you have to put yourself out there. You have to fill out an application and send your work. Um, the, what is it called? The Association of Writing Programs also has a, a mentorship program called Writer to Writer. And that's a, this is a good opportunity to say, for all of these things, do your research. Just because something is out there saying, just because someone's out there saying they're an agent or that they're running a contest or that they're a literary magazine or that they're a mentorship program doesn't necessarily mean it's the right opportunity for you. So, so do your research and, and ask around, make sure it's legit. There are also unpublished novel contests. There are lots of these. Um, the Romance Writers Association has one. The Women's Fiction Writers Association has one. Probably lots of other genre associations have them. There's a local uh, writing organization in Richmond, Virginia that does one where you make like, you know, the prize is like $500 and they publish the first 30 pages of your novel in their magazine or something like that. I mean, so it's just cool. Yeah. It's, a, it's an opportunity to, um, to get novel length work out there. Yeah, I was going to add that I know the PNWA, Pacific Northwest Writers Association, mm -hmm. I think, has a contest. And and it's just an example, but I think most local uh, bigger associations do. And at least with that one, you also get critique from two different yes. critiquers mm -hmm. as part of it. Mm -hmm. So there is a fee, um, but you also get feedback, which is really yeah. nice. I mean, I submitted to one of those, the, the local one. And um, I didn't win, but I got like a page of feedback. That was really helpful to me at the time on my, um, it was like my first 50 pages or something like that. So now is probably a good time to discuss entry fees, right? Because some things cost money to submit. Um, a lot of contests cost money to submit. On the one hand, you want to be sure that it's a legitimate operation, that they're not just trying to scoop up a bunch of, you know, entry fees and, you know, not really give you anything in return. On the other hand, most of these contests are run by nonprofit organizations or nonprofit, you know, publications that operate on like zero money. So, of course, they have entry fees. This is how a lot of literary magazines um, generate income, as they run fairly prestigious short story competitions and creative nonfiction competitions and stuff like that, which we'll get into. Uh, yeah, I know we've had a lot of questions about that on Moms Writers Club. I had a few people ask me, like, where to submit their work for things like mm -hmm. that. And honestly, like, it's something I just don't know yes. about. So yes. I'm yeah. excited to hear more. <laughs> Understandably, a lot of people are leery about um, spending money on submission fees. You should never pay an agent for a submission. That is not entirely the case with um, contests and shorter work. There are submission fees. It's legitimate for there to be submission fees. Um, and a lot of times they are very low. But one way to approach it is if you are interested in submitting to these kind of things is to set yourself a budget for submission fees for the year. You know, like just figure out what works for you, what you can afford, um, and like how many contests that's going to allow you to um, enter and how many, you know, general submissions that's going to allow you to send and just go from there. Two things. One, if it's an association you are a member of, it's usually a lower cost. And sometimes it is the same cost to enter the contest as a non-member as it is to become a member and then enter the contest as a member. Right. So often there are, there are other benefits, like you then have access to like some of their workshops or their online videos or their um, like online critique group. Right. Right. Um, and then the other thing, like I said, with the one I did was that I also got feedback. Mm -hmm. So it might have been a $35 or $50 fee which I think is on the higher end, but um, I also got feedback from it. So yeah. So another thing that you can put on your list of 100 rejections is applications to residencies and um, like application-based workshops and fellowships and stuff like that. I've done a residency twice now at a center in North Carolina. It's called Wild Acres. If you're on the East Coast and you like the mountains, this place is absolutely heaven. Um, and I won't even call it the best part because this place is so amazing. But one of the great parts about it is that it's free. It is absolutely free. I go, I stay in a little cabin for a week all by myself. They feed me amazing food in this amazing location. And it is absolutely free. I just have to get myself there. And that sounds wonderful. How did I get into that? I applied, <laughs> right? I looked, I applied, I sent my work and I hoped for the best. And they said, yes. 
So look for the ones. There's lots and lots of residencies out there. There are ones that you pay for. There are ones that you have to apply for and send your work, and they're very competitive, and you still have to pay for them. So my advice would be look for the ones that are free and apply to the ones that are free. Um, Wild Acres is really nice for moms and parents because it's one week. A lot of writers' residencies are long. They're like two weeks minimum up to months long. And, you know, who can really do that if you have kids at home, you know? So look for the short ones, look for the ones that are free and the ones that feed you and just go for it. The application fees for residencies are usually pretty high. They're usually $25, $35. Um, I think I've seen them as high as 50. So this is obviously not something you can do if you're on a really tight budget. Um, some of them have some flexibility for the application fees, you know, if you aren't able to afford it. Um, but that can be a little more tricky. But obviously, I don't know, unless you have lots and lots of money, you're not going to be applying for 10 of these, you know, next year. But, you know, find a couple that you think are a good shot. And besides, it's like the most awesome week of your life at those places. Oh, so there's a so there's a website called the yeah so it's called the Association of Artists Communities. Um, we'll put the link below, and it's a big searchable database of hundreds and hundreds of artist residencies all over the country. Some of them are super specific in what they're looking for. Some of them are very general. Some of them are very competitive. Some of them are less competitive. They're all over the place. Every state. Um, some international, just, it's a, it's a really cool site. Sometimes I go on there just to like dream about how great it would be to like go to this one in New Orleans or something like that. Um, so that's that a great so fun. And also applying to selective workshops, you know, like the Suwannee Writers Conference um, is a 10 day thing in Tennessee. It's fairly literary, um, but you go and you stay in these dorms at this university and you do, you know, writing workshops for a week and a half. And there's lots of these. There's bread loaf. There's, you know, a bunch of other kind of literary ones if you're into that. So any of those, um, any of those events that are competitive and application based where you have to send in your work, those count towards your 100. Right. So. So why not? So you see what's happening here is like we've got this goal of 100 and we're like, Ooh, what else can I do? to get it on my list, to get myself up to 100, right? And every single one of these things that you do creates an opportunity. Okay, so now we're gonna talk some about submitting short work. So those of you guys who, who don't write short stories or don't care about that, you can tune out now, bye. <laughs> <laughs> but we have got a bunch of questions on this and I come across questions on this on Twitter fairly often and I'm always sending people the same resources. So I started out writing short stories. I mean, I was working on writing a novel when I first kind of got serious again about seven years ago. But I was also writing a lot of backstory for my novel, which turned into short stories, which I had done some of in college. And I was like, great, I have these short stories. Let me do something with them, right? So I started figuring out how to submit to literary journals, which is the main market for short stories. I mean, there are the occasional like mainstream magazines that print fiction. They're like practically non-existent anymore. There's the New Yorker. I think The Atlantic occasionally publishes fiction. The Washingtonian sometimes publishes fiction. There's probably a few others out there, but sort of mainstream magazines barely ever publish fiction anymore. And if they do, it's usually they want you to be agented. And I'm starting to think like, let me just start sending stuff to The New Yorker and just see what happens, right? Put it on my list. Um, you should. Why not? But then there are all these literary magazines out there. They're mostly associated with universities and they are looking for short stories. And, and the editors of literary magazines are kind of like literary agents in that they, they have like a stable of authors. They have some well-known authors that they solicit work from, that they work with frequently or who have published in the magazine before. And then they have this big slush pile. And they are really looking for gold in the slush pile. They really are so excited when they find, especially debut work. If their magazine is the first publication to publish your work. They are super psyched, right? If they find you in the slush pile and you're like their gem. Are you speaking from experience? I am. I am. <laughs> um, so I submitted, actually, I submitted a short story that I wrote at Wild Acres on my last day. I had been slaving over this novel the whole time and I just felt really stuck. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot leave here without finishing something. 
So on my last day, I sat there for like seven hours on my bed in my little cabin and I wrote a short story. And it just like, blah, I just like vomited out this short story. Totally warmed up from like a week residency in heaven. And I submitted that short story a bunch of places and it got um, selected by the Missouri Review for publication. And, you know, a lot of people don't know anything about literary magazines, but the Missouri Review is like, they're like a big deal. It was like my heart about stopped. I was almost as excited when that happened as I was when like the agent told me she wanted to talk on the phone. <laughs> that is a big deal. I, uh, I don't read literary journals, but I am aware of that one. Oh my God. I was at my daughter's soccer game and I got the email and I was just like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And she's like, what's wrong, mom? What's wrong? And I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. So she's been on this, they've been on this whole journey with me. It's so much fun. There are a couple of, resources for um, finding literary magazines to submit to or finding any, any, you know, there's a bunch of magazines that aren't even so much literary. They're more like genre based. Um, I don't know. Literary is such a loaded term in a way it sort of bugs me, but there are good resources for, for tracking these places down, for searching them to find out the places that are going to be a good fit for your work. So one of them is duotrope.com and they have a searchable, database they have a free version and they have a their paid version is something like five dollars a month or something like that you can pay for it for a couple months while you're looking for places to submit um, they have a really powerful um, search function where you can select all these different um, variables you can select only magazines that are open for submissions a lot of literary magazines close for submissions during the summer because they are staffed by, well, they have professional staff, but their reading staff are college students. So a lot of, the, or grad students, right? So a lot of the um, first round read through the slush pile is done by volunteers or students who are not there in the summer. So they tend to close. Um, some of them have very small windows, like the Virginia Quarterly Review, which is a really prestigious lit magazine, is like only open for submission in November or something like that. So you kind of got to be aware of that. But Duotrope allows you to, to search all that stuff and to link directly to their websites and their submission instructions and all that stuff. Um, there's also submittable.com. And I would say the three quarters of literary magazines actually have you submit through submittable.com. And it's really nice. It's kind of like if all agents were to go on Query Manager and you could just do all your queries like that, which I think would be so nice. Um, it's funny. Um, for grad school, I had to submit like my finished project in giant research paper form, and they also used Submittable. Yes. And it's so funny to me that like, you know, literary fiction journals is, are using the same uh, process yeah. that like research journals are. Yeah, I think a lot of I think a lot of academic um, institutions probably use this. But the cool thing about Submittable is you just create a, an account. It's free. And they, are, they also have some searchability, right? And they'll have a, a feed on their, you know, homepage that sort of shows you what deadlines are coming up. You know, like X publication is about to close to submissions or whatever. They have a thing like Query Tracker where um, it shows you all your submissions. It shows what status they're in. And it even shows like it's been received, it's under consideration, um, you know, and then it turns color if you, if they reject it or accept it. Um, most literary magazines will charge like a $3 submission fee for general submissions, not their contests, but just submission for publication, um, which I felt, not bad. No, I felt like I am okay with this. These guys are you know, operating an arts organization on like no money. So um, it can add up if you're submitting a lot, but I thought $3 was okay. And it's also something to consider whether you want to submit for publication or submit to their contest, right? So there may be a, a magazine that's got a contest going, but you just love the magazine. And really what you're after is just being published. You know, it'd be nice to win a contest and get a few hundred dollars, but really what you want is to be published in this magazine. In that case, you could skip the $25 um, contest fee and just do the $3 submission fee and get considered, right? So that's what I did for a lot of them. I only entered a couple of contests and I didn't win anything. 
Um, but I did get four short stories published in fairly good literary magazines throughout this process. And that was out of probably 60, 70 submissions. I'd say even more than searching for a literary agent, um, getting short work published is a numbers game. Okay, so one last um, good resource for submitting short work is um, there's a guy named Clifford Garstang and he's fairly active on Twitter. And he has a website, I think it's called the Perpetual Folly Listing of um, Literary Magazines. And he has this like clever way of ranking them. If you're interested in getting your story published in like one of the more prestigious literary magazines, you may wanna be careful about submitting to one of those and then submitting to like a lesser known literary magazine at the same time because like what if the what if the one you really want to get published in wants you but the other one accepts you first right so his take on it was here's a ranking you know and you can like take a chunk you know you can take like you can submit to one through ten you know and then if none of them take it you can submit to ten through twenty if you're looking you know for that sort of prestige publication which I was so like in querying and in being on submission, if someone is interested, you then tell everyone else. Does that not happen in the literary journal world? That's a good question. No, no, that doesn't. Interesting. You have to choose okay. whether to accept publication or not. Say yes or no. I mean, I don't think they have time for that. Yeah, I was just as curious because yeah, it's like no, such it's a part a really of our question. world now, you know? It's really more like they expect you to say yes, right? Um, unless you're like a well-known author, you know, you're not going to have literary magazines fighting over, you know, where you publish your work. And even if you are, they're going to solicit you and you're either going to say yes or no. Um, yeah. So you submitting is basically you saying, you know, I want to be published in your journal. And if you pick me, I'll say yes. That's the assumption. Um, if yeah. you get picked by somebody and you say yes, I, I mean, it's not you don't have to. You don't ever have to. No, totally. I was just wondering if but, there was that process yeah, of no, like, okay, not. well, let me know. Every, let me let everyone else know. Yeah, not really. Um, if you do get selected for publication, um, you are definitely supposed to let everybody else know that um, you're withdrawing your submission because it's been snapped up by somebody. Because otherwise, they're reading through it and considering it and spending time when it's when it's already spoken for, which isn't fair to them. So what are your biggest tips for submitting short work? So follow submission instructions, just like you do when you query agents, right? Everybody's doing that, right? Um, <laughs> fortunately, with literary magazines, they are very, very similar. So it's not quite so much like you're tweaking everything like you do with querying. Um, don't agonize about your cover letter. Submittable, you know, gives you space for a cover letter. It's a good idea to say, you know, dear editor name, right? And you can go to the mastheads of these magazines and find out who the fiction editor is or who the general editor is. Um, and then say something like, I'm submitting my short story title, um, X number of words for publication in your journal. I, in the beginning, I would say, you know, if you select this um, for your journal, it will be my first published work. So they knew that, like, I'm a shiny debut author. Um, and maybe say a little something about you. I am a writer living in Charlottesville, Virginia, blah, blah, blah. Like, super short. I mean, this is not a query letter. This is like, this is like 50 or 100 words, if that. You can probably even do without it. Um, get the editor's name right. I think that's helpful. I, is it a make or break? Are they going to turn down a great short story just because you said dear editor instead of dear so-and-so no but you know again a little something that you can control that might help submit to a lot of places right like i said it's a numbers game just submit tons and tons of different places and um, see how you do they all say you should buy a couple of issues of our magazine and read it and see if it's a good fit and that is 100 percent true however literary magazines can be like 14 dollars and it's expensive and it takes a lot of time to um, read them all, you know, so you can go to their websites and you can usually they have a story up for free before you have to, you know, pay for a subscription to read more. 
and you can get a sense for what they're into. And the search engines help with that a lot too, with sort of getting a sense of the character of the magazine. And if they reject you, but they say something personal, if you get a personalized rejection that says, you know, we really admired this work, but unfortunately it's not a good fit for this issue. We'd really like to see um, work from you again in the near future. If you get something like that back, they really mean it. And look at the name at the bottom of that email and keep it in a file somewhere. And when you have another story, send it back to that person and tell them, you know, you were kind enough to ask to see more work from me. So here's my story, such and such, right? And they will remember, these are small organizations, small communities. Um, they will remember that they asked. So how did you keep track of all your queries? Well, originally I was like, oh, I'll make this giant spreadsheet. And I know people who do this. And then I discovered Query Tracker and realized they do it for you. And they have, they have a lot of the information already there. And each agent's uh, profile has all the links you could ever need to any of their information. So I used Query Tracker or used Query Tracker. And uh, it's just super simple. You say that you submitted, how you submitted, and like the date. And then you can like track your submission. Right. And it keeps track of how many days have elapsed since you submitted. If you get a request, it keeps track of how many days have elapsed since you request. It's really convenient. So the other thing I did just for fun is I had a, I meant to grab it. It's in the other office. But um, I had a jar and I'd put like a really pretty bead in every time I sent a query off. And anytime I got a request, I would put like a silver or gold bead in. And it was really pretty to have this jar. And to think that like one of those beads would represent like the agent that said yes someday. Um, people That's I know awesome. who have done this say that they're going to like string them up eventually and mine are all just in a jar still. <laughs> But um, that's, I don't know, it's just kind of like a fun visual to see yeah. and to keep you inspired. I've heard of people who um, who put like a dollar or five dollars in a jar every time they submit their work somewhere, you know, and then like at the end of the year, they've got this big chunk of money to do something fun with. So Query Tracker is awesome for querying agents. Of course, you can't keep track of all your other um, submissions that also count towards your 100 rejections. So I had... Uh, Excel spreadsheet. I actually used an Excel spreadsheet for a long time until Jess talked me into doing Query Tracker, which I did not regret. It's really convenient. Um, but I put in little little functions in my Excel spreadsheet for like the date that I sent it and then like today and it would like calculate the time elapsed. And then there's like, a, I had a space for notes and then I had a space for submission fees. So like I could kind of keep track as I went through the year, like how much money I was spending on submission fees because it's easy to lose track. That's a good idea. So we'd love to hear from you all what ideas you have for getting to 100 rejections a year. Thank you so much for watching with us today. If you could give us a like and a subscribe, that would be great. It helps other people find us. You can find us on Twitter every other Wednesday night for our Moms Writers Club chat. I am at author Jess Payne. And I am at Sarah Reed Author. And if you look at my pinned post, you will be able to see when the next date and time of our next chat is. Um, I think that is everything. You can check out any of the stuff we mentioned by looking at the links below. Thanks for joining us today.